fracking happening in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, all throughout Appalachia. They've been trying to frack New York, but so far people have been keeping them out, which is good news. But fracking is just starting to move into Illinois and to Michigan. They're trying to get into Ontario as well. Um, this is really, really booming and, and really spreading rapidly. But when I say that I want to get us grounded in the land that these stories come from, I also mean that quite literally. I want to take a little time to talk about the complex geological history that made these fossil and mineral deposits possible. And also along the way, I want to talk about some of the really fascinating and sometimes dramatic twists and turns of the evolution of life that brought us all the biodiversity that we have today. Because this part of the world is not only rich in, in mineral resources. Um, we have incredible abundance, abundance on the surface as well. So I'm going to start 3.5 billion years ago, when the Earth was very different than it look, looks today. There were no continents, the entire planet was covered in one big ocean, and life was just beginning to appear. Uh, so there were these little tiny single-celled organisms called cyanobacteria. They were the very first life forms that were able to capture energy from the sun. The oxygen that cyanobacteria produced as a byproduct of photo photosynthesis was actually toxic to almost all previously existing life forms. So the introduction of photosynthesis, which is the basis of almost every ecosystem today, was actually the cause of the first major extinction event. That's ironic. I think there's some important lessons to be learned here. We, we can see that sometimes big changes come from very small beginnings, and also that life is tenacious and very adaptable. And it's gone through all sorts of different phases before we've gotten to what we have today. If we look at about three billion years back, that's the time when the rocks that formed the continents began to coalesce and float to the surface. And actually, between 3 billion and 1 billion years ago, uh, the continents wreaked havoc on the planet. They were skating around over the thinner yet more dense ocean floor and repeatedly colliding with one another, causing deformations like mountains and trenches and fault lines. And when one landmass would subside under another, the rock that was pushed into the mantle would violently boil and erupt through the surface in the form of volcanoes. And these volcanoes spit up uh, sulfur and all sorts of heavy metals uh, and, and other he metals and other heavy elements onto the surface. This was the time period during which sulfide mineral deposits formed. This was a time period at which the oceans were sulfuric acid, when, su when acid rain was normal, right? everyday kind of occurrence. Um, and for about four billion years, the Earth was a very hostile place. It was, uh, the chemical composition of the oceans and the atmosphere was fluctuating wildly. The climate was fluctuating wildly as well. There were time periods when the Earth was boiling hot. There were times when it was frozen solid. And it was only about 500 million years ago that conditions got just right for life to finally flourish. Life had been there all along in little tiny, little tiny, tiny critters in the oceans. But um, 500 million years ago marks the beginning of the Cambrian explosion of biodiversity. I want to especially focus on a, a period that began 350 million years ago. A very important evolution happened at that time. We call it the Carboniferous Era. Carboniferous means there was much more carbon in the atmosphere, which meant that the Earth was much warmer, which meant there were little to no polar ice caps, which in turn meant that much of what is now dry land was under shallow seas and brackish swamps. Right? The reason we have so much sand here is because it was a, a beach at one point, a big beach. Uh, and this was, this, was a, this was an earth that we wouldn't like very much, but it was great for plants. And there were huge algae populations in the oceans, and there were ferns and club moss and horsetails growing taller than the trees we have today in these inland swamps. As these plants were growing to these huge sizes, they were sucking all this carbon out of the atmosphere, changing the climate, stabilizing the climate in the process. They were also absorbing heavy metals and other toxic elements out of the land and the water, storing it in their cells, cleaning up the environment and paving the way for more biodiversity to follow. 
When these plants died, they sank in the water and they didn't decompose because the bacteria that are able to decompose things underwater hadn't evolved yet. So over millions of years, they just stacked up. And over more millions of years, uh, silt and sediments washed over them, and over more millions of years, all this stuff became super compressed, and it turned into coal, and oil, and natural gas, which is a byproduct of those things. So all this sequestered carbon, all this uh, sequestered toxic stuff, um, is what we're pulling out of the ground and putting back into the atmosphere and the land and the water right now. Uh, and it was, it, was, um, it was because of these plants that, uh, that, uh, that, that the earth was made a, a much more nice place. I can't think of the right word. I'll just say it's a nice place. And it was only during the Carboniferous era that animals finally made their way onto land for the first time. The continents were barren for uh, billions of years. Uh, here, this is an ichthyostega. It's the common ancestor of all amphibians. This one's playing a marimba on its tail. Why, why not, I guess. Oh. <laughs> um, and uh, during, oh, excuse me, 250 million years back, there was an unknown cataclysmic event. It wiped out 95% of life on Earth. But remember, life is tenacious. And actually, the absence of so many species opened up space for new evolutions to come around, like dinosaurs. Right? That was the beginning of the Mesozoic era. That's the one we like the most. Uh, and not only did dinosaurs evolve during that time, but flowers and the bees that pollinate them showed up during the Mesozoic era. And during the Mesozoic era, huge forests covered almost all of the land on Earth. And they sequestered even more carbon than those Carboniferous era plants had. In fact, at the beginning of the Mesozoic era, there were 3,800 parts per million carbon in the atmosphere. Five million years ago, there were only 100 parts per million carbon in the atmosphere. And that was the beginning of the Ice Age that we're technically still living in today. 500 million years ago was the age of giant mammals like this glyptodont, which was a giant armadillo bigger than a car. And, um, and of course, it was also the age of glaciers. We don't actually have any pictures of glaciers, but glaciers were the geologic force that uh, was most important in shaping the Great Lakes and the land around them as we know it today. Especially because when they melted and receded, they left behind huge amounts of clean water. In fact, 95% of the surface water in North America is within the Great Lakes watershed. And it's because of all that water that, 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 that this region is so abundant and has, and has so much light in spite of its cold northern climate because water is the source of all life. Actually, we have a lot of water around here in the Driftless region too, right? It's just in the hills, um, underground, but it, but it pops out here and there. And, th and that brings a lot of life to this region as well. When people showed up on the scene much more recently, they adapted their lifestyles to the different locations they found themselves in. This is the root of cultural diversity. People f figuring out the best way to live in each unique location they find themselves in. And in fact, in these parts, uh, indigenous people found all sorts of clever and effective ways to steward the land, kind of like beavers steward the land and improve the ecosystem around them by building these dams. Not only do they provide housing for themselves, but they provide a place for fish to grow big, for this heron to grab a bite to eat, and they, s they slow down the flow of the stream to prevent erosion and build up rich topsoil. People were approaching the land with the same type of mindset, cultivating food forests, maintaining prairies through regular burning, so that herds of elk and bison could grow to huge numbers and, and sustain all sorts of other animals. Uh, in fact, when Europeans came to the so-called New World, they were astounded by the abundance of life here, uh, on land and in the waters and even in the skies. They regularly reported seeing flocks of birds so massive they blotted out the sky. A big change happened when Europeans showed up in the Americas. They brought an entirely different mindset, an entirely different value system with them. Um, for thousands of years prior uh, to, to the discovery of the Americas, Europe had 